Thank you for this morning, Lord. Uh, thank you for this family, Father, that you've created, Lord. Uh, I thank you, Father, for my brothers and sisters here, Lord. I do pray, Father, that you would just open up your word to us this morning, that you would speak to us through your word, Father, that you prepare our hearts, do that work, Father, breaking up that hard-heartedness, Lord, that we have so that we can receive your word, Father, so that we can grow, so that it will produce what you've desired for it to do in our lives, Father. We know that it won't go out void, and that it's going to do its work, Lord. So we give you permission to do that, Father. Forgive us for those areas, Lord, for that hard-heartedness, Lord, and help us, Father, just to focus on you this morning. Bind the enemy from all the distractions, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week... We picked up where I'd left off a few months ago in 1 Timothy. Now, 1 Timothy is an excellent little letter written to Timothy to help him as he looks to establish order in the body of believers there in Ephesus. That's where he's at. And this letter that we have been studying started out looking at how the church should deal with people who come in to teach the word and making sure that they teach no other doctrine. See, there's always been an attack on the gospel. And during this time, teachers would travel around from place to place preaching about God. Some had a a complete knowledge. They understood uh, the whole gospel message about Jesus Christ. And others, they didn't teach Christ at all. So Timothy had to make sure that these false prophets weren't coming into the church and causing division and confusion. Then Paul moves on as we go through the letter to why he left Timothy in Ephesus and how he is there to help the church get established. Help this body of believers know how to deal with one another and operate as a family. Now, this letter addresses how people are to be chosen for the ministry, how the money uh, that the church collects should be spent in some areas, like supporting widows and supporting elders. And Timothy here in this letter is addressed as as a young man. And he has been given a a huge responsibility. See, his job is not to stay in Ephesus and become the long-term pastor. He is to come alongside the church, oversee it, and help it get off the ground. Correct some of the areas that have started to go sideways. Establish order. Appoint some leaders. And this would be a monumental task that just would be overwhelming to take on. But then someone brings in a letter from his friend, his father in the faith, something that will help give him some guidelines on how to do what he needs to do for this little church here. So Paul wrote him some things to look for when trying to find elders, trying to find deacons, and uh, just how to establish order in the body. Now, we finished off last week talking about discipline in the church. I had pointed out that elders don't get special treatment when it comes to discipline and that I believe we're actually held to a higher standard. See, our sins affect those around us. Your sins affect your, yourself and they affect your family and they affect those around you. But the sins of those in leadership could affect the whole church, bring shame on this entire body and ruin it. But mostly... It could cause the Lord's name to be blasphemed, to be spoken negatively. Can you believe Calvary Chapel teaches this and their pastor did this and I can't believe God and just to speak negatively against the Lord. And God doesn't take that sort of thing lightly. So there's a, a, I believe he holds leadership to a higher standard. See, we all sin, and not every sin needs to be confessed before the church. We don't have church confessions where I bring the latest person up and we share what they've done. Most church discipline is dealt with before it ever gets to that point. So when looking for people to place into positions of authority to help lead the church, we need to be very careful on who we select. So Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, things that he should be doing, things he should be looking for to help make these decisions. Now, he says we need to be praying. We need to seek wisdom from the Lord. Then examine this person you're considering to see if their life is already being lived for him and see if there's a call on their life from God to serve him in this capacity. Those are things we were looking at last week. Now, we can't always see the sin of someone uh, that they're involved in, and others we can see pretty clearly. So we shouldn't judge. 
We shouldn't grab on. We shouldn't place into ministry those people too quickly because it could do a lot of damage to the body. Now today, we're going to be looking at this last chapter in 1 Timothy. Uh, Just taking a look at this little letter, and right off the bat, there are some instructions on how the members of the church are supposed to handle themselves outside of of these four walls in their community. So we're going to pick it up in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So if you have your, your Bibles or whatever you use to read the Word of God, we're going to read through the first 12 verses. It says, Let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So those are the the verses we're going to go over today. Before we do, we're going to see if we can't plug this thing in real quick. As I'm reading, I got myself a nice little pop-up that said, hey. So, quite a mouthful in those those 12 verses that we're looking at. But we're going to go back and we're going to try to break them down and make it a little bit easier. So if we go back to verse 1, it says, when we look at all the people that are making up the church during this time, he picks up in verse 1 talking about slaves. So slavery was a big part of the church. I read uh, in the Roman times, it could have been somewhere up to a third of the church. A third of the people were slaves. Some of those were uh, freed. You know, they paid for their salvation. They got out of it somehow. Others were masters and uh, others, uh, some other percentage of it was other people not involved in any of this. But Paul writes to these guys, to those that are under bondage of slavery and the rest of the church members, and he says, let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. Now, As I got into this, I started off thinking that a bondservant was someone who chose to be a slave because they loved their master and wanted to serve them. You know, a bondservant, he chooses that. But as I studied this verse, it is not saying that. See, the practice of a slave placing himself under his master because he loves him is a Jewish principle that we find in Exodus 21, 5 through 6. See, this is where it talks about having your ear pierced with an awl showing that you are willingly making yourself a slave. But in this section in Timothy, Paul is addressing people who are slaves during the Roman Empire, and the area where Timothy is overseeing is in Ephesus, not in Israel. So bondservant here means slave or just a servant. It could also include someone who willingly wants to remain a slave, but it doesn't mean that specifically. Now he writes, let these servants who are under the yoke of bondage count their masters worthy of all honor. I think 
This would have caught some people by surprise when this letter was read before the congregation. See, when I think of slaves, I think of being mistreated, uh, having no rights, being used and abused, and then disposed of when you're no longer useful. And this is the way it was in the Roman times. Not every master was cruel, but there were plenty that were. See, slaves weren't even considered people. They were more like property, like a lawnmower in my garage or a vacuum in my closet. And surely this is not what God created you to be. And Paul says, we are to honor the ones who have authority over you. Count them worthy of all honor. Now, this is the same word that was applied to elders, honor, giving your master the reverence and esteem for their position over you, not just in your words, but in your actions. Now, as a slave who believes in Jesus, you are to honor your master. This is where your faith is put into action. See, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you are to live your life differently. You work for your master harder than you ever have to show him honor. You esteem them highly because of Christ in your life. And Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, you gave up your life for that new life that Jesus is offering you. In a very real sense, you have said, I want you to be my master and to reign as my Lord. I will serve you. And when you gave your life to Christ, it was crucified with him. It no longer rules and reigns unless we allow it to. See, Christ now lives in us, and we live this new life by faith. And when we apply these verses to our own lives, To our own day, you might say, well, I'm not a slave. I don't have a master. But this also applies to our own system of having employees and employers. How should our relationships look like to the world and to our bosses? See, Paul's instructions would be that you are to honor your employer. And we do this because of him. We do this to show honor to those in authority over us because we're doing it for God. And so that the message about him and his son would not be blasphemed. Now, when you think about living your life for God, is this the way that you do live? Is this how you live now? Is he the most important thing? Do you live your life differently in the workplace? Do you show honor and respect to your boss? Or are you taking advantage of him and wasting time? See, this life we live is to be lived for God through faith in his son. We don't just live that life out in our own heads. My Christian walk is not private. It's not just between God and myself. It is lived out in real life, and the people are watching us. You know, I was wondering last time that we went out as a church when we did something, uh, and I was thinking, well, what about the, the theater? When we filled up all those seats at the theater, did the people know that we were different? Did they see us differently? Did we act differently? When we followed it up by going over to Wendy's afterwards and hung out and fellowshiped, did they see us as being different? Or did we leave a mess just like the rest of the world? Because we're called to live our lives differently. Romans 11.11 talks about provoking Israel to jealousy because of the gift of salvation given to us. I believe we all should be living our lives in such a way that others, when they see us, would want this relationship with God that we have. And when they see you, do they want that relationship? Are you different? Because you're called to be. Verse 2 goes on and it says, And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So does it change if your boss is a believer? Does it change how you should respond? See, often we hold believers to a different standard than non-believers. And when they do something, there's a lack of respect. We immediately jump to, how can someone who claims to be a believer in Jesus Christ act this way? And you called yourself a Christian. Paul tells Timothy, if they have believing masters, don't despise them because they are believers. Don't treat them different than you would a non-believing master. And don't treat a non-believing master different than you would a fellow believer. See, they are both in a position worthy of honor, and we are to give them this honor. 
Now, Paul does not directly speak against slavery. He instructs Timothy that he needs to teach the gospel's ability to change a life, to change a heart, not teach about slavery. See, Paul is not condoning slavery. He actually wrote in 1 Corinthians 7, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. And there's many other verses that he wrote. But if you are a slave, an employee, another reason you should be working hard for the boss is because the one who benefits is a believer. Now, when I first looked at this, I thought, well, as we help our believing bosses, he's able to turn around and help other believers. Because of what I do or what we do, then they're able to help somebody out. But this could be the case, but we have no control over what they do. This verse is talking about your boss being the one who is benefiting from your work. You are pouring a blessing onto someone else who also loves your Lord and Savior. He just happens to be the boss. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, as we live our lives before the Lord, we can also encourage others in their walks. We can help to stir them up, encourage them to live for God. Now, Paul exhorts Timothy to teach those in the church to live for Jesus outside of the church meetings and in the workplace, wherever the day takes you. Take it back. Live it for the Lord. He goes on and says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. I'm going to break this one apart. It says, uh, Paul had said, if someone teaches something that goes against this, well, he's talking about slaves, right? If they tell you that you should not honor your master, that you should fight against this yoke of bondage, don't fellowship with them. It would be possible that some of those who taught this, who had called, who God had called, weren't the educated, the rich. You know, they could have been poor people in the church. Not everybody who stands before the church is like Paul was, you know, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, you know, studying the word since his youth. They could have been a slave themselves. But no matter who it was, they are to stick to the word and teach no other doctrine. It is by the word of God and his spirit that our lives are changed. Paul just shared that a servant should honor his master, and if anyone teaches otherwise something different, then his message doesn't line up with the gospel. Jesus himself took on the role of a servant, lived a blameless life, and was whipped, beaten, slapped, and mocked for us. Yet he honored the Father by being obedient even unto death. It is so important that we keep teaching the whole word of God and not teaching to specific situations like slavery, and slavery has changed a lot, and the message of Christ is a huge reason why. Now, this doctrine he talks about is the Word of God, which we have today. It's the whole plan of salvation from the Old Testament writings to the New Testament, and the apostles' doctrine was the teaching of Jesus and how he fulfilled all the law and prophets. It's the Gospels, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the law and the prophets were taught in here with Jesus' own words recorded for us. Now, these teachings go hand in hand with a godly life. Now, godliness means to have the character or heart of God being godly. A godly person does those things that please God. He is completely devoted to him, and we please God when we do what he has commanded us to do. We please God when we come to that saving faith in Jesus, when we love one another, I'm bringing this up because godliness is mentioned 15 times in the Bible, and nine of those times it is mentioned are right here in First and Second Timothy. See, there are lots of religions that try to tell you that a godly life is based on works, on the keeping of the law, uh, and it's not on grace. See, there are lots of different religions in the world, and they have a lot of things in common, but all religions are not the same. Only Christ can give you salvation. It says there's only one name under heaven given by which we must be saved. 
Jesus said in the garden, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, yours be done. See, Jesus is the only way, and anyone who teaches otherwise is not giving a teaching that accords with godliness. He says, this person is proud, not knowing or knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. See, the one who teaches a different doctrine is actually teaching a false doctrine. Why would anyone want to teach something that goes against the word of God? Well, because they are trying to increase themselves. Maybe it's for people's esteem or financial gain. Whatever their reason, they think that godliness is the means by which they'll benefit. And Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. They appear to be godly, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. See, these are the things that God hates. Someone who is proud, someone who causes disputes, who teaches lies as the truth, and those who are trying to take advantage of his people. Now, coming into the church without a good understanding of the gospel message, they cast doubt on the teachings, knowing nothing about them. See, they love to argue over words and cause disputes. It becomes something of a competition for them to win people to their side. But what they have to offer in return is empty, lacking the truth of God. It doesn't fulfill. See, the advice given in 2 Timothy is the same here. We're to turn away or withdraw yourselves. We don't want anyone to think that we agree with this person because we don't turn away. When you stand there and you just kind of nod your head, you know, it's like maybe they, they agree with them. We don't agree. It has to be the Word of God and the Word of God only. When they come in and they teach false teachings, they teach things that go against what his word says, we're supposed to turn away from them. He picks it up in verse 6 and he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. I think this verse could apply to the whole chapter. See, in this verse, Paul is stressing the importance of contentment over covetousness. Godly living over worldly living And says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Some think that the church is a great place to make a living. Just like in the day this was written, there are plenty of people who are using the church to make a living today. And Paul would say, true riches are found in godliness with contentment. James says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. And then in Jeremiah 9, he says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. See, in one aspect, we have someone who is trying to look like a godly person, competing for the people's attention in an effort to benefit from it. But we are told they are proud. They cause friction and disputes in the body of Christ. And on the other hand, you have someone who has heard the good news about salvation through Jesus, and they are content with where they are in life. They are living to please Him and denying their flesh. This, we are told, is great gain. This is a good thing. See, contentment never comes from external things, but it can be found in right living before the Lord. Now, when we do things that go against God's will for our lives, our hearts have no rest. 
I don't know if you've been there. I have. Uh, we see, we place ourselves at war against God's will for us. I want what I want. And when we're following him and living to please the Lord, we have that inner peace. I know I'm not at odds with him. I want to walk hand in hand with him. We have contentment. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, it says, Not that I speak in regards to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul had learned how to be content in all things, and he even tells us how. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, if you are still chasing after your fleshly desires and living for what this world has to offer, know that you're fighting against God's desire for your life. You're going against him, and it's hard to go against the grain. And there won't be a peace in your life. See, contentment is found in God when we realize he's our everything. The Bible has a great deal to say about contentment, being satisfied with what we have, who we are, and where we're going. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? That's in Matthew 6. Brad had taught about this. See, Jesus is telling us to be content with what we have. Real godliness should be the goal of your life, along with contentment. He says, for we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. This is very similar to that verse in Matthew 6. See, building on being godly and having contentment, Paul says, We came into this world with nothing, and we leave it with nothing. But there are those who are trying to grab all they can of what this world has to offer. He who has the most toys win, says the bumper sticker. But what do they win? What do they get? See, the believer in Jesus should be content with what God has already given them. Has God not given you enough? Has God not blessed you enough? And still you want more? The Lord said to David through Nathan the prophet after David's sin with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 12, it says, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. He wants to bless us. He has given us enough. The Lord is the one providing for us. When will we learn to be content? Now, Ironside made this point with a story. It says, have you heard of the Quaker who wanted to teach a lesson to his neighbors? He had a large sign put up on a vacant lot next to his house. And on the sign, he had these words painted. I will give the deed to this lot to anyone who is absolutely content. Any applicant was directed to apply next door. There was a man living in that community who had great wealth, and he drove by and saw the sign, stopped and said to himself, my old Quaker friend wants to give away his lot to anyone who is absolutely contented. If there's anyone in the community that ought to be contented, it's me. I have everything I could wish for. So he went to the Quaker's house and knocked on the door. The Quaker came to the door and said, to the, uh, and the man said, I see you want to give that lot to anyone who is contented. Yes, said the Quaker. I think I can say that I am absolutely contented, the man said. I will be glad if you will make the deed out to me. To which the Quaker responded, Friend, if you are so contented, what do you want with my lot? See, this desire for more is called covetousness. To covet what someone else has. To want more. And you don't have to be rich to covet. You know, you just, I don't know, I got enough, but Amazon's so easy, I could just have it sent to my door. You know, and so I want to find something to order. Uh, I don't have to be rich, I just want, I just covet. The Jewish Talmud says, and I don't know if it says this, I just found this in a, in a teaching, but they said, the Jewish Talmud says, 
That man is born with his hands clenched, but he dies with his hands wide open. Coming into the world, he is trying to grasp everything, but going out, he has to give up everything. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So whether you are slave or free, rich or poor, you can be contented in God. We're also told in Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, I don't know who wrote it, but it's been passed around quite a bit that even though you can't carry anything out of this world when you go, you can use your resources to send treasures ahead. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we can send treasure ahead. Our contentment isn't in the food or the outfit. Our contentment is in the one who gave them to us. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds a house, the builder's work is useless. Unless the Lord protects a city, the guards do no good. It is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing you will starve to death when it is God who provides for us. So don't fear or put too much hope in what this world has to offer. Learn to be content with the way God is providing for you already. The things that make a rich man in this world won't matter in heaven. See, every single thing we accumulate in this life is only meant for this life. Your stored up wealth, your vehicle, even the clothes on your back are only meant to help you in this life. And when your hope is in the Lord and being with him, your focus is there. Your desire is there. The value that a godly life brings when it is coupled with being content with what the Lord has provided for you is great gain. It's a huge reward. It isn't only profitable for this world, it's also going to be profitable when you step into eternity. He says in verse 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So just like there's a blessing when you live your life for God, there's also a danger when your desire is to be rich in this world. We are told that desire will cause a fall. You will begin to do all kinds of wrong things to get money, things that eventually will hurt you and cause you to have a lust for more, and finally it will cause your destruction. Verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See, the desire to be rich, the love of money, is more dangerous than the money itself. There's nothing wrong with having money. Many people in the Bible had plenty. But it's that desire that is so dangerous. Money is not the root of all kinds of evil, but the desire, the love of it, that is the root. As I'm looking at this, I was thinking about a, a grafting. You ever heard of grafting? Grafting is a method used to give a plant a different rootstock or to graft another branch onto a plant. Because of grafting, you can have one tree produce different kinds of fruit or give it different kinds of blossoms. Now, this love of money becomes a root on which all kinds of evils can be grafted into. And like a root, it will grow and spread out, becoming stronger until those who have continued to feed this root will wander away from the faith because of the greed and the promise of what riches will give you. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now, just as the love of money in the heart is a root of all kinds of evil, when the love of Christ comes into the heart, that too is a root that every good thing may be grafted onto. He picks it up in verse 11 and says, but you, O oh man, you, O oh man of God, flee these things 
and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. See, Paul directs this next statement to Timothy, but it applies to all believers. He says, you, O man of God, don't think you are strong enough to handle this kind of temptation. Don't think you are stronger than others when it comes to this desire in your life because it is a snare, a trap, by which many have fallen. You need to run. Some of us may think we're stronger than we really are. This is Timothy. He's set up to oversee the church. And Paul cautions him to be careful because these things are a snare and a trap. Timothy was just as susceptible as we are to the temptations that riches bring. And Paul knows this. So his advice is not just to flee. Don't just flee, but chase after righteousness. Romans says in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, this walk with God is not just about what we don't do, but it's about what we are pursuing. See, unlike the riches that people chase after, Timothy is to pursue a different kind of treasure, Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. These are the treasures he should desire. Don't just run from evil, but overcome it by pursuing righteousness. And verse 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul also charges Timothy to not be passive. Like I said earlier, it's not just a a personal, you know, in my head faith. It's something that's to be lived out. It's something that the world's supposed to see. We provoke them to jealousy. Timothy's not supposed to be passive. He needs to fight the good fight of faith. See, this Christian life is not a spectator sport. It is a battle, and every soldier needs to train and be prepared for the fight. So are you sitting on the couch? Are you spectating? Are you preparing? You shouldn't expect to get up off the couch when it's time to fight and be victorious in battle. I hope you are. But that shouldn't be the expectation. If you're living for this world, you won't have to battle. You won't have to worry about it. It's only when you live for the Lord that the battle is waged. There is a battle taking place. You know, some may start to fight, then give up. Some have not counted the cost, and others don't see the need. But those who are in the fight, when the battle is over, will in the end lay hold of eternal life like a prize. See, eternal life is the prize. Timothy and all of us are to strive for. Yes, the work of Jesus on the cross for our lives is complete. It's done. We don't have to worry about that. Through his death and resurrection, everyone can have eternal life if they will believe in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean we have nothing else to do but wait for his return or for death to come and take us. See, we fight to not let sin rule and reign in our lives, to not let complacency get in there. We fight just to read our Bibles and to pray. Sometimes it's a struggle. There is this spiritual battle taking place that we are all called to engage in. All of you are called to fight. That's why we have that armor listed, right? The breastplate of righteousness, the helmet, the shield. So we're all supposed to engage in this fight. It says, to which you were also called and have confessed. See, not everyone is called to the battle I have before me, but everyone is called to fight. Timothy, Paul points out, had a call of God on his life. And even though there is a call, it does not insulate him from the battle or the temptation. Just like all of us need to flee temptation, so does Timothy. It's important that every believer knows that he or she is in a spiritual battle. There is no way to get out of it. Whether you believe or not, there is a battle taking place. Awareness of the spiritual battle around us is very important. Not only will awareness, not only awareness, but being ready 
prepared, to have the courage and the right weapons are also crucial elements to engage in this spiritual battle. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. See, our fight as Christians is a spiritual fight. Our fight is not against other believers, not against non-believers. So our weapons need to be spiritual weapons. These weapons we can use are mighty in destroying every defense the every, to every attack of the enemy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. See, we've been told to take our faith into the workplace. We are a new creation and called to live a life that is completely devoted to the Lord. So the world will see, the world will know. Not chasing after what this world is offering, but what God is offering, and to be content with what he provides. See, he knows what we need, and he is a good father giving great gifts to his children. So we fight against everything that tries to draw us away from him, against our own sinful desires, so we can finally receive the prize of eternal life and to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this little book of 1 Timothy, Father. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be, to have that godliness with contentment. Like you said, it's, it's great gain, Father. Uh, the rewards of that godly life are, are more than we'll ever know, Father. I just pray, Lord, that you do that work in our hearts, Lord, that you would help us, Father, to be ready, to be prepared for the battle that comes our way, Father, so that we can, Father, not be armchair quarterbacks, Father, but that we would be in the battle, Father, that we would be ready for the fight. Lord, and if there's people here today that haven't even taken a step, haven't even, haven't even given their lives to you, Father, and they've been touched by the message, they want what you're offering, they want this contentment, this peace that they can only have through you, Father. I don't want to embarrass, embarrass them, Father, but would you help them to just lift their hands as we pray for them, Lord? If there's anyone here today that hasn't asked Jesus into their life, I want to give you an opportunity. I don't want you to go out of here without having the opportunity to receive the Lord. And if that's you today, would you just shoot up your hands so we can pray for you as a body? Is there anyone here? How about if there's someone here that just would like the body to pray for them? It's been a battle. It's been a rough week, and you've come in battered and beat up. Your shield has some dents. Your sword has some kinks. Uh, and you just want us to pray for you, would you shoot up your hand so we can pray for you? Thank you everywhere. Thank you there. Thank you there. Thank you back there. Thank you over there. Thank you back there. Thank you there. Thank you over there. Thank you back there. Father, you see these guys. Lord, you, you see us as a body. We, we want to be ready for the fight, and we've taken some hits. And it's not easy to stand up after being beaten, Father. But we are victorious in you. We haven't failed. We may have lost a skirmish, but the battle belongs to you. We will win the fight, Father. You are more than enough. So, Father, those who have come in beat up, those who just want us to lift them up in prayer, Father, would you be with them, Father? Would you speak to them, Lord? Help them, Father, in this area. Uh, Strengthen them, Father, for the fight. And help them to see that their life is based on you, Father, that this contentment is found in you, Lord. Go before the needs, Father, that we have here, Father, and help us as a body, not just to pray for them now, Father, but to remember to pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord, to be there to support them in the battle, Father. We thank you for this day, Lord. We pray, Father, that you continue to go before us. In Jesus' name, amen.